Hi everybody, we're just waiting for everybody to join our live connection. Ryan, lovely to see you there. We definitely miss you already as well. Nice to see you on here. Alexandra, hello. Sole, Cancelos, hola, ¿qué tal? Gracias por estar, chicos. En breve empezamos. Apparently I've got the video on the side again, so we'll try and turn it. Somebody let me know if this works. <laughs> okay, does somebody want to let me know if that's better? Gracias, Sole. Se ve recto. Okay, as ever, remember, guys, if you have any questions, uh, we have Alexis with us this evening as well. Si quieren hacer una pregunta en español, hoy también está bien que estamos aquí para, para todos en inglés y, y en español. Uh, any questions, please just pop them in the chat and I'll try and go through them with, when the guys join us on the screen. Yes, Ryan, this afternoon, clearly uh, things had quietened right down again, but uh, I have to say, this evening, there certainly seems to be quite a few developments which uh, Ben and Alexis and Rosie are going to take us through, and we'll probably make a start very shortly. We wanted to offer you a different perspective today, having been close up to... Uh, the volcano over the last couple of days we wanted to just make the point on the one hand how close this is to populated areas now um, and you can see the whole lava flows coming down the side of the hill and going towards the sea we haven't reached the sea yet but I'm sure that uh, Ben and Alexis will, will give us an update on all of that Then, yes, we'll definitely uh, address that question. That's a good question, one that we're uh, asked a lot. So I'll make sure we ask that once we have the uh, initial update. Hello, Divas from India. You're our scholar. Lovely to see you here. Very nice to see you. Thank you for joining us. Okay, guys, we're just going to be joined by Ben and Alexis. Very close. Uh, Sorry? No, that's fine, that's fine. You stay there, Alexis. But I cannot sit there. Okay. Good evening, guys. Hi. Do you want to give us a quick update as to what's been going on today? Because it's been a, a very different day today. Yeah, so hello, everyone. Welcome to the to day three of the live stream here from the, the farm eruption. We're at Mirador del Teme, um, about 15 kilometres away from the eruption. Um, and as Sharon says, it gives you great perspective here of just how close this eruption is to population centres. Um, 
So yeah, so over the, the last 24 hours we've had quite um, quite a few developments. When we joined you um, last night there was sort of very high um, lava fans and very sort of explosive high, high Strombolian jets. Um, but then since then, um, sort of a few hours after we left into the early hours of the morning, um, the activity decreased somewhat. Um, and continue to decrease and actually when we uh, came to this locality this morning about 10 a.m there was no eruptive activity uh, at all from the vent um, you know it just gone quiet there's some there's some degassing um, which led some to speculate you know is, is the eruption coming to to a, a, a close um, which to we said you know no it's not we 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 don't know. This is quite common for you know this eruption type um, for it after a while to you know stop and, and, and start again. So then, um, and sure enough, so about an hour after we we came, it started up again with sort of ash rich um, plumes and continued that activity sort of throughout the day. Um, and then this afternoon, um, again, it was there was very little activity for all of the afternoon other than a few you know, sort of small plumes every maybe hour or so um, you know so people were, were speculating what's next for the eruption but actually maybe just after we left um, and decided to go get some dinner uh, maybe three or four hours ago um, the activity has started up again um, and now we've got the situation um, where we've got two um, two active vents so the first one being the flank, the flank vent, which is the one you can see, um, which we actually saw opening up a couple of days ago, um, and it had been sort of a more minor vent, uh, albeit growing, but today it is the principal vent, uh, and you probably can't see, but just behind it there is a uh, there is a small vent which. Um, Comparatively, is shooting magma a lot higher, and that is the vent within the uh, within the central cone. So, Alexi, we've had sort of quite a lot of developments over the last 24 hours. Yeah. As, I, as I've said, it's been quite a yeah. quite a roller coaster. So, yeah. yeah, because for the last week, what we have had is like it continues uh, <laughs> eruption, not changing a lot. We have seen some increases and decreases in the energy, but basically the vents were the two main vents at the top of the volcano. And uh, in the last couple of days, we've seen this uh, like flank eruption in the lower parts of the volcanic edifice. And if you remember, this uh, flank eruption has been uh, kind of growing a little bit and then suddenly decreasing and there, there came a point when it disappeared and then it became, so it's been changing quite a lot. But the curious thing today is that we wake up uh, expecting that the lava flows would reach the sea. And the main concern today was uh, whether this lava flow would reach the sea. And there has been uh, some, uh, the people have been, uh, kind of uh, locked indoors <laughs> the, in, in the areas where they saw that these lavas were to, going to enter the sea and this hazard of the release of volcanic gases uh, forming part of uh, included in these uh, clouds of steam rising because of the rapid vaporization of the seawater but then in the morning the situation changed completely because suddenly when we came as you said the the volcanic activity stopped completely for for a couple of hours and we were wondering well, what was going on i mean there were like four uh, possibilities or theories to trying to explain what uh, had happened because obviously the contrast was amazing. We have had this week with a very steady state type of phenomenon and suddenly today stopped completely. So, so, so there were like four possibilities. One 
once that the ruption has finished, it would be the easier probably. The second was that probably the volcanic vent had been obstructed by some reason because there have been some partial collapse of the main vent, of the main edifice that may have, and we saw yesterday, you remember when suddenly there was a massive explosion yeah. and all the pyroclastic material fell into the flank eruption and yeah. it stopped it's for a while, there. remember? Yeah, so that was yeah. a second possibility. A third one was that eruption that hadn't finished, but maybe there was a period of, of no eruption because there was some kind of uh, the, the, the waiting to, for a recharge of the system. And another possibility, and that would be the fourth, is that probably the, the dike may have been traveling sideways to some other area because there was a still uh, seismic activity and there was a lot of gas emissions. So, so it's contradictory to have high gas emissions and not to have an eruption. Yeah. Happened. So that, it, it was a very strange yeah. situation. And in, and in fact, on that on that fourth point, there was um, a seismic swarm earlier today, um, a few kilometres south. Yeah, we will talk about that later <laughs> because that may be. Yeah, but that's true. So, so we were really, um, I mean, quite confused. But in any case, what I said because we have had many interviews today. What I what I think it was the most likely scenario was that there was some kind of uh, interval of repose that the eruption was going to continue uh, but probably it was going to waiting for a recharge recharging the system yeah. and I think that's the case actually it's very common in any case in these eruptions I mean we've, we've seen a week of continuous activity but as the eruption progresses there are there are periods like this where suddenly for hours, nothing happens. It's been quite radical, the change anyway, so that was so surprising to suddenly see. So, so throughout the day, we have had periods of activity and periods of repose and alternating, but until eventually the whole, the whole afternoon was completely yeah. inactive. So we were thinking, what's going on? The ratio may have finished, but then, a couple of hours later, we saw on TV, because we went to have a rest, because we hadn't sleep, slept a lot. So we, we and during that uh, period of rest, we saw that on TV that this had started again. I wouldn't say started, it continued. Yeah. Do you agree with that? Yeah, definitely. Um, and yeah, if anyone wants, you know, an, an example of, of, of an eruption that, that has done this, the current uh, Mongolian eruption in the Rakhianes Peninsula in Iceland is a great example of this. Um, <coughs> that's going been, been going on for about just over six months, I think now. Um, and so sort of the first month or maybe two months of the the eruption that was pretty much continuous. But since then, um, you know, it's been going through these periods of of repose. You know, where where nothing's happening. Um, <coughs> And then other periods where it is erupting, yeah. and I think at the minute it's it's sort of on on a period of it it, it, it doesn't doesn't yeah. sort of erupt for you know it'll go up to maybe even a week without erupting and then have a few days. Yeah. Before coming, I want to comment on something because we before we we, we came here, we spent a week studying the Siete Fuentes Fasnara for eruption. Now, obviously, if you consider that eruption, that was a three month long eruption. And the first stage of the eruption was this Siete Fuentes eruption. And then that eruption lasted for nearly a month and then it stopped for a while. And then a second vent opened up along the fissure. So you imagine, I mean, if this happens here, it would be amazing because we have here a fissure that was in principle 800 meters. But in the case of the eruption we were studying by using geophysical studies, this man, using magnetometers and seismometers to see what the plumbing system structure is. So, so that eruption was a three months. And then you have a, a 10 kilometers, imagine the same situation here, 10 kilometers long. One vent erupting for a, for a couple of weeks. 
stopping and then a new vent opening a kilometer away from them. And that go, going on for a month. And then stopping and then at the end of the fracture, about eight or nine kilometers away from those first vents, we have the third phase. So, I mean, we are very impressed with this eruption, but imagine an eruption like that in 1704, 1705. Yeah. 10 kilometers long eruption, three vents with repose periods between them. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, this is the type of eruptions we have in the Canary Islands. So, so although this is quite impressive, it's been very destructive. I insist it's a typical Strombolian eruption. And at the moment, at the moment, we only have this fissure here, but then I want to connect with this swarm that has been dete detected at the very uh, south of the island, yeah. quite far away from here. Is that a new vent? Is it a new fissure? It, because what we are looking, what, what, what we see is again the same pattern of uh, seismic uh, swarms and the uh, and uh, they are pretty shallow at the moment, eight kilometers, yeah, seven to ten. Seven to ten. Yeah. So, so are we going to have another erupted episode uh, pretty far away from here? Who knows? Yeah, um, yeah. These are clearly uh, very dynamic eruptions. <laughs> um, I guess one thing you might be able to notice from the live stream. Um, between sort of last night um, and tonight is in is in the uh, the fountaining. So the the main fountaining we could see last night was from the three uh, two or three central vents, and you know it's very narrow and very um, high and quite explosive. Whereas the uh, whereas the fountaining we see tonight, um, you know it's it's uh, the fountain's much wider and much. Uh, you know, much shorter and much less explosive. Um, Alexis, do you want to sort of give an explanation as to why we see that? Yeah, yeah, we always see that in, uh, it's quite a typical pattern in Stromboli eruptions. And uh, in fact, this happened, it happened the same in the eruption I was talking to you before, this, uh, the one we studied, because Fasnia and Siete Fuentes are at the higher ground. And the last eruption is at the lower ground along the fracture. And what you see is that the first two eruptions, Siete Fuentes and Fania, were more explosive. And then the last one, which is lower along the fracture, concentrated diffusive activity, which is a long lava flow that nearly reached, it, it ended 100 meters away from the coast. Yeah. So this is the same pattern. We, we have a smaller fracture here, but we have the same pattern. At, the, at uh, higher, uh, higher in the fracture, you have the most explosive activity. And this is what we've look, been uh, looking at uh, these past few days, with two main jets, I remember, sometimes three, but yeah. two main jets at the top of the volcanic edifice. Uh, these lava fountains, which is quite a, an explosive activity with a lot of pyroclastic material, material following ballistic trajectories and falling close to the vent and constructing the whole edifice, but then in the last couple of days we've been looking at this flank eruption that started very, very small, but it's so curious that the reactivation of the eruption is taking place mainly yeah. in this flank fed, which is, as Ben told us, is the one you see at the moment, and it's the main eruption, it's producing very, this very fast and very fluid uh, lava flow that we, we can see from here. Mm, this lava flow apparently is flowing on top of the previous uh, lava, which is already some of yeah. more co co cooler and, and more solidified, but this is traveling pretty fast. And this, this may be the one that eventually reaches the, the coast. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, Sharon, if we have any questions in the chat for us. Yes, yeah, we do, actually. I know. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we do have. Um, Sven was asking, how dangerous is it for Tenerife and other Canary Islands? In other words, is there any connection between what's happening here and the other Canary Islands? Should we be concerned? Um, if, if this is to do with, um, you know, I know I've seen a few people, um, there's been theories, you know, going around the the volcanoes are, are 
connected between the underground. Island. Yeah, which no. which no is, is not true. They all have independent the independent systems, you know, they all act independently of each other. Um, it, it's true that in the past there have been some some coincidence yeah, between so eruptions taking are. place in different islands nearly simultaneously. Yeah, but it's all nothing to that's do with any connection underground. Yeah, yeah. So this is a myth. Yeah. Actually. It's a um, myth. And then um, I mean I guess in terms of the, the impacts of this specific eruption, um, on other islands. Um, you know, I know we've had, uh, particularly at the end of last week, where the eruption here was more explosive, a lot more ash produced, um, and the, the wind direction was, was sort of preferential. Um, you know, there was some sort of ash, ash clouds drifting towards, especially the south of Tenerife. I know the, the Tenerife South Airport was affected for, for a few hours. Um, I think on Friday, um, but yeah, since then there hasn't been any uh, disruptions to any of yep. the islands. And I think any other impacts to any of the other Canary Islands are likely to be minimal. Yeah. You, you have to realize that this eruption is fed by a dike, and these dikes are this volcanic intrusion, and it is a very localized intrusion coming from the mantle and being injected into the uh, lithosphere, the lithospheric. Uh, Plate at this case, so, so so what we have is a volcanic edifice, which are independent. They are not connected. They they, they are connected with deep mantle, all of them obviously, but not. I mean, this this idea that if you have an eruption in one island, and it may trigger an eruption in another island, that doesn't fit the models of the mantle plume, which is the model we used to explain the volcanic activity in the ocean islands in general, especially in the Canary Islands. So the answer, this very long answer is no, <laughs> no connection. Thank you very much for that explanation, very comprehensive explanation, guys, because it's certainly something that we are asked a lot. Um, yeah. And people who are maybe thinking of going on holiday to Tenerife or, you yeah, know, or in other Canary Islands, they might be thinking yeah. that. Let me, let me add just a, a, a brief commentary is that many people ask me, oh, well, La Palma is erupting, so does, does it mean that Teide is going to erupt as well? Mm. They are different volcanic edifices, and, and they are different behaviors. Teide is a phonolithic stratovolcano. This is a basaltic fissure eruption. They are not related. Thank you. Uh, if Sorry, did you want to add something to No, I was just going to... Uh, and say we've talked quite a bit about the, uh, you know, the physical characteristics of the eruption. Um, I think I was wondering if we could just get uh, Rosie on to talk about. Uh, we we will actually. I just have one more question, if okay. I may, about as yeah. we're here. Yeah. Rosie, yeah. Is that all right? Let's finish the question regarding. But it's in, it's in it's in Spanish. Um, if you if you'll if you'll allow, we'll just have a quick question in Spanish for one of our followers. Yeah. So I, can, estás ahí? I can answer in both. Vale. So, so solo le pregunta a qué se debe el silencio y reactividad del volcán hoy y comenzó otra vez. Es buena señal de que queda menos o es normal? In other words, Soledad is asking if what, what does it mean well, that it stopped yeah. and started today? Does yes. it mean it's coming to an end or is it just normal? Eh, en español yo, igual per se. Sí. Mm, they, they are asking me. Well, in fact. Si me lo dices like, en español, por si favor. Sí, te lo en español, perfecto. claro. Yo estuve explicando antes en inglés que hay cuatro razones por las que podrían explicar que la actividad eruptiva se haya detenido temporalmente, como ha ocurrido hoy. Una explicación sería que la erupción finalizó. Ya, vemos, ya hemos visto que eso no es así. Podría ser que el conducto eruptivo haya sido bloqueado por algún fenómeno y haya impedido que esas lavas salieran. Puede que, una tercera opción, puede que mm, el sistema se hubiera detenido esperando una recarga de magma desde las profundidades, que parece ser la explicación adecuada. Y, 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 y la cuarta, mm, pues no recuerdo ahora cuál era, era, ah, sí, que, que el magma se estuviera eh, trasladando, se hubiera trasladado lateralmente hacia otra zona. 
Entonces, esas eran las cuatro posibilidades, no son las únicas, pero eran las cuatro posibilidades que intentaron explicar esto, estos periodos de reposo. Hemos visto que esto se ha reactivado y, y ha pasado el día activo, en ciertas horas eh, se volvía a reactivar y en ciertas horas se volvía a detener. Al final, un, un intervalo de reposo muy largo, pero al final de la tarde se reactivó completamente de la manera que ustedes ven. Entonces, pues, es, yo creo, no sé si eso responde, eh, porque me estaba preguntando a qué se debe, a qué se debe, ¿verdad? Claro, claro, que, que si se está ruido, acabando es, o sí. si... Sí, entonces la explicación si de los reposos es fundamentalmente que la erupción ha parado porque hasta ahora ha habido un aporte continuo desde el, el, la profundidad eh, alimentando la erupción, pero mm, han habido reposos porque... Mm, han habido, no, había, no había suficiente magma para hacer, eh, seguir la erupción y ha tenido que esperar el volcán, y estoy hablando ahora como si fuera una persona, pero el volcán ha tenido que esperar a que llegara más material para poder seguir la erupción. Entonces, esa es la razón. Alexis, that's great. Thank you very much. So, uh, as with every evening, we like to put a social context on on the science, if we may. So, thank you, Alexis. I think we'll, we'll now ask Rosie to, okay. to come in. Rosie, if, yeah. uh, if you wouldn't mind giving Excellent. us a... So I, I let... Uh, thank you. Thank you, thank yeah. you. <laughs> no, thank you. Yes, you're welcome. <laughs> Call me later if you, you have any more. Yeah, if I can it. help you further. Yeah. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so we, we've been talking, obviously, about the, the physical uh, side of the eruption so far. Um, but it's obviously, you know, very, very important to always consider the social impact of this eruption. This eruption has been locally devastating for people who've lost lost their homes. Um, it's even more sort of um, set to us today. Um, you know, when, when you know, people people were speculating earlier that you know, is the um, is the eruption going to be ending? Um, you know, cause in, in in the event that the eruption ended, what would happen was, was quite soon. You know, all this heat, all this reporting that's been done um, on the Palmer by news stations, by everything, all the attention that's been given. To this eruption and, and this, in its people would, would probably fizzle out very quickly um, and that would not be ideal at all because you know then the people here who've suffered you know so much would, would just would just be would just be left you know be behind and, and forgotten about and we we don't want to do that so um, one thing that myself and Rosie have been doing um, which we've actually shared um, on our Twitch, and if you go on the Geotinary Twitter page, you'll be able to see it. Um, is we've been collating, um, we've been collating sources that you can donate to. You know, if you wanted to um, support the people affected by these eruptions. So I'll just let Rosie tell you a bit more about, um, you know, those those options. Yeah. Um, so as Ben said, uh, we've put together a thread that we shared on our own personal Twitter. Twitter account, so my account is at Rosie underscore Rice underscore. Um, ben, Twitter account. Yeah, and my Twitter account is Ben's Ultimology. Um, and it's also um, been shared on the Gia Tenerife Twitter account as well. Um, so we've kind of put together a thread of different plate different places where you can donate and different ways that you can donate. Um, so the local councils here have set up um, bank accounts that, so you can donate directly to the local areas that have been affected here. Um, there's also a centre in, I think, Santa Cruz de la Palma that you can go and donate clothes or any items in your, that you have lying around that you might want to donate because you have to remember that I think as of today it stands that 569 houses have been destroyed and you know people people have lost everything um there's people right now who have nothing and if you can donate just anything and can take it down to one of these centers um that would just you know it means so much to those people that have been affected um what's been incredible to see is that there's a lot of local artists um who are getting involved and trying to raise funds for the relief effort and they're doing this by you know i've seen one person who said if you donate 10 euros to the local uh, council bank account then you can get a, a print that this artist has produced 
Um, and I've also seen very similar kind of posts by artists who are local to La Palma. And, you know, it's just incredible to see that. And the Red Cross have also been working tirelessly throughout this eruption to help those in need. Um, and there's ways that you can help the Red Cross out and donate. And the local council here have set up a Google form so that if you're interested in volunteering to help the relief effort, you can sign up via this Google form. And everything that I just mentioned is shared on our Twitter thread. Um, so if you'd like to check that out, please just head over to Island Line or Ben's Twitter account or the Jim Henry Twitter account. Yeah, and yeah, I would I would recommend I'd say if you do one thing after today's live stream, I'd say you, you, you check those out and see if you can you can help um, in in any way possible. Um, and just one thing I'd like to reflect on that happened today, just in, as I've mentioned how it's been destroyed, um, someone came up here and asked to borrow a pair of binoculars because they wanted to check if their house has been destroyed and we'd also, as we you know, we've been up here all day and we've heard people burst into tears and I think, you know, it just really brings it home that there's, there's you know, people behind this eruption, there's, you know, as that lava flow right behind me flows down, there's, there's houses that are getting destroyed out there and just that moment today, I don't know about you Ben, but that really, you know, it gave me goosebumps hearing yeah. that. Um, and it really, you know, if I can highlight anything from today to reflect on it, I, it's, it's that. And I think the next time I read kind of facts and figures about how many houses get destroyed in natural, natural, natural disasters, that I'm never going to read it in the same way again. It's, ne it's not just a number that you read on social media, it's not just a number that we read off every day. I know we post about it and kind of give the facts and figures, but I just really want to stress that, you know, every number of a house that gets destroyed, that's a family that lives there. Thank you, Rosie. That's a, such an important point, actually. And I think the more time we spend in La Palma, the more stories that we hear, the more that, that impact really uh, comes to bear. And I want to really uh, thank Ben and Rosie. They spent a lot of time today putting together the resources for people who want to help. They've put the thread on their Twitter accounts, and we've retweeted it on the main account. Because sometimes these events, you know, uh, they are sensationalised. We have lots of close-up photographs, lots of press and journalists, um, but we don't have the scale necessarily because they're not scientists. So sometimes we do need to have a little bit of perspective on this. And sometimes when you're seeing this from the outside, you can feel very helpless because you're just assaulted by all of these um, images and stories. And uh, actually, sometimes we feel that we need to, something practical that we can do to help, and that's certainly something that we can do. Um, so that's very good. How do you feel the sound of the uh, eruption has changed today, guys? It, it's been it's been variable with with the with the eruption really. Uh, when we got here this morning, obviously there was nothing, and and you know it, everything was, was very still. Um, I don't know about you, but even when you know throughout the day when the sort of event was reactivating you know just just for a bit um, you know it was it definitely felt a lot weaker than it had been and I, I, I couldn't hear anything I'm not sure about you no I didn't really hear anything I think like I heard the very like the odd very quiet rumble but again you know it could just be the car going down the road um, and I was actually sat at around I think like around half five um, this evening I was just sat on a call when we were back at the accommodation and then you know, I finally heard the roar of the eruption again. It was almost like, you know, it, w it had woken up. And then as we were at the accommodation and making dinner, we started to hear it a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing we've noticed is that we have like sliding doors um, at the accommodation that lead out into the patio. We were sat around just having dinner last night and all of a sudden they shook and we heard them shook and we just kind of exchanged a glance of like, what was that? Was that someone outside? And we've heard that I think we heard it before before we came out here that that had happened again, and that is actually from the, the, the volcano. It's the volcano making the the doors on our on our house shake. Yeah, yeah. And, and bear in mind where we're staying is is you know probably roughly about twenty kilometres away from the eruption. You know, it's on all also sort of a lot lower elevation. There's a lot of you know there's a hell of a lot of land. Um, 
in between us. So you know, if it, if it's like that, um, there you, you you know you can imagine what it's like up close. And in fact, um, I think we've mentioned this in one of our other live live streams. But um, a couple of days ago, we were uh, um, we're at a site that a Spanish uh, news crew have, which is approximately two kilometres. Um, away from the eruption and you sort of get down it, you get to it down this sort of narrow street with sort of big flat sided industrial buildings um, on either side and I think Alexis had um, a news connection I know you, you Sharon were in, were in the car with, with him and you know the whole street was reverberating the whole car was was, was shaking from the, from the sound I thought it was Alexis jiggling his leg, actually, <laughs> until he stopped and the car kept going. But yes, no, absolutely. Uh, and another job I think that's been really important today is just to try and add context to some of the news reporting that's been going out. Alexis has been um, appearing on a, on a string of, of channels, national, international, local. Um, and at every stage, we've just been trying to provide context so that factual, measured uh, information goes out that gives people the right information and tells the story but doesn't cause alarm uh, unnecessarily, or that doesn't sort of press too hard on the grief that people are, um, are, are feeling. And, I, and I'm, I'm just, to this day, you know, I used to be a journalist, and I, I, I refused to go into news years ago, because I felt it just had this real need to sort of press people in their sore spots to make them cry. Uh, and actually, one national news journalist was actually quite shaken when I got here and I said what's the problem and he said well I've just heard from uh, from my production team that they want me to go up and make sure that I get people who are you know in, a, in, a, in an extreme situation so that I can capture that on camera he said and I just don't want to do that and I just said then don't you know you have a choice yeah, don't I do that. I think what's interesting is that like, as I'm doing my dissertation whilst I'm out here um, and I'm using interviews as a way of data collection is that you know, in order for me to do those interviews, I have to kind of go through this uh, long kind of ethical assessment and ethical clearance. Um, and, you know, I think it's so important that, you know, even if you're a journalist, if you're someone like just either me or Ben trying to report on this eruption once we're here, that you, you consider the ethical implications of what, what you're doing here and the way you ask questions, how you ask questions, where you choose to take your interviews, you know the the context behind the interviews that you're taking and you know are you do more harm than good i yes. think is always so important to bear in mind and it shouldn't just be people who are out here to do research that should have to consider the ethical implications i think it's so important for everyone here whether you're just here to see the eruption or whether you're here to report on it or do research on it i think you should you know deeply consider you know why you're here who you're asking questions if it's the right time for you to ask those questions i think it's so incredibly important to bear in mind absolutely that's such a good point rosie and um, i have to say i'm a trained journalist and never once was that part of my training i'm horrified to say um and to this day i don't think that is something that a news crew would necessarily bear in mind you know they'd want there's always a uh, an urge to get your story up top in the news report or on the you know to get people clicking on your uh, link or on the front page of newspapers um, and unfortunately we've just and, and certainly with the advent of social media I know that's something you've looked at as well perhaps you guys would like to address that I mean I'm a bit of a dinosaur in terms of social media and we do a bit creaking and groaning with you guys helping out but you know um, again we've heard stories of people coming across and wanting to take actually quite distasteful photographs and then publishing them all, all over social media very proudly because they feel it's a very good photograph and you just think, what are you trying to achieve with your photograph actually? Yeah, yeah. Uh, what, what is it that you're so proud of? You know, Is that is that something you feel as well, guys? Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, and one thing I've been kind of trying to research in my dissertation is the role of social media in all of this and the role of social media with has a perception with kind of communicating hazard risk that's going on here. Um, and one thing that's been quite interesting to learn about, um, I just think of one story um, that I found out yesterday is that there was a woman who is originally from Florida but lives in Grand Canaria and she's 57 years old. Um, and started using TikTok over lockdown, like many of us. Um, and she found that the stories that she was seeing on TikTok, like, you know, like just reported by the local people here, 
that used that media stream. They were raw, they were unfiltered, they were, you know, put up there to get so many views. It was just the people here wanting to get their stories out. And I think it gives this incredible platform for people to share their own narratives. Um, and just hearing the fact, you know, she was a lot older than I guess most users of TikTok are. But very that's, young, Rosie. Yeah. Very young she was, if I may say so. <laughs> um, but that, you know, that's the main way that she'd got her information, and she'd actually preferred to get her information there compared to the news. Because as we've been discussing, I think in her words, the first 24 hours of the coverage here were excellent. Um, but after that, it was very much, you know, how can we keep this story going? What way can we spin it? And what headlines can we get? And it's so interesting because, you know, the, almost the best thing about social media is also its downfall. And one thing that I think we're both experiencing, kind of going back to what we've always talked about with important, accurate information, is that, yes, you know, social media gives a platform for the everyday person to report their story, but it also gives a platform for the everyday person to share their opinion. And that opinion might not always be correct. Um, and I think that's, you know, it's important to bear in mind that there's, there's two sides of social media. Yeah, um, and I'd sort of like to add to that and say, you know, what we've just been saying about, you know, if, if, if we, you know, if, if you're here reporting, you know, on, on the, the ground, you know, obviously you need to be for good reporting, you know, you need to be there, making sure you do, you know, for, for good, good than, than harm. And, and, you know, it's not really talked about or thought about much, but, you know, if you're reporting events like these, on, on social media, you know, you need to go through the exact same ethical process. You know, I think, um, you know, personally, you know, I've seen that misinformation has been, you know, a big, you know, big issue um, you know, during this this eruption. You know, people sharing sort of unreputable sources and, and, and gaining traction. Um, and you know, it's just it's just going through that process, thinking, you know, does does this seem right? Does does this story look sensationalist? Because you know, if if you share it, it's not you know, it's not just all oh, you know. I've, I've shared a bad source. I've made a, a mistake. These things have real you know, ramifications. I know Sharon as well, myself, and I think Rosie as well. We we we've been getting messages, you know, from from people who. You know, all, all, all over the world, who were, were absolutely terrified by this eruption. Um, you know, for, for for no good reason, just because you know they've read these these stories of people in the family. You know, have, have told them these stories, and obviously, then be you know non non experts like us, it can be very difficult for them to discern you know what's accurate scientific information, you know, and what's not. And I think there's. Yeah, a lot of accountability for people posting on social media, you know, especially you know journalists and people who might know better um, to just think because these these stories do have a really wide-reaching neg negative impact both sort of worldwide and also you know people close to people on the farm and people you know Tenerife I've heard from people you know are really really unnecessarily afraid because because of these the propagation of these stories. Absolutely, and it comes back to a, a, a sense of scale as well, doesn't it? Um, and I think, you know, we've seen some awful pictures and, and the human stories, but but it still comes back to the fact that at the moment, it seems that the emergency services seem to be dealing with things very well. As we say on social media, we, we do encourage everybody to follow the official sources of information here and to really abide by whatever the, the official emergency services say in terms of exclusion zones, staying out of certain areas, not getting too close. And that was something we had to make very clear this afternoon on some of Alexis's media appearances, even though it seemed to have sort of quietened down and people said, oh, the, the, you know, it stopped. Um, and he was saying, actually, people, please stay away. This is a natural behaviour of, of this type of volcanic eruption. Again, I'm talking as a non-scientist, so I'm just reporting what he says. Um, but the key point was, you know, it could restart at any point. There's still a lot of heat left in this in this lava, um, and you have to still be uh, really vigilant. Um, and here we are, you know, just a few hours later. You wouldn't believe that this was, you know, the way it was this afternoon when you see this now, right? So we have another question here from uh, Alison. Is there a communal system that warns people as to what they need to do 
uh, or text messages. I haven't seen anything to do with text messages. There's certainly a lot of on social media and radio and television and, and lots of that sort of information we've seen out, haven't we? Yeah. I haven't, I haven't seen anything about text messages either, and that is uh, kind of a a tool used during that natural disaster is where it's kind of pinged off the phone mast and if you're nearby you receive that text but I haven't seen anything about that and you know as Sharon said a lot of it has been on social media and that's you know it's an interesting thing for me to look into because the it then you know it affects who gets that information and when especially when we live in a you know 24 7 news society where we want news now when it happens we want it straight away and a lot of kind of the older generations, you know, they will follow the news outlets, the television, the newspapers to get their information, whereas the younger generation are mostly all on social media and that's how they get their information. So I think one thing that I'm incredibly interested to kind of understand a bit more is how that then affects how the older generation respond to the eruption compared to the younger generation. Um, but I will say that the response by the people in the Palmer has been absolutely incredible. Um, the response by the local government has been incredible. Um, there was evacuations before the eruption even began. Um, so. Yeah. And actually they have been doing an incredible job yeah, of keeping yeah. ahead of it. Uh, yeah. And we've seen some of the emergency services, um, you know, coming off shift. We've interviewed some of them and heard their stories, which we'll gradually uh, be putting together and compiling. Um, and I think that's one thing to remember, even though we see these sort of uh, very blown up pictures in, in the media, that it is. Or affected in any way, shape or form, but it does mean it's in an area that, you know, with the amount of right amount of sort of planning and contingency and, um, you know, advanced information, they can sort of contain and hopefully keep ahead of. Uh, and we hope that's what keeps happening. Um, I would also like to address um, the really irresponsible, irresponsible and thoughtless social media work that, that we have seen some people doing, uh, you know, and just sort of posing stupidly in front of the lava and thinking it's quite funny or cool uh, to take photographs in front of, you know, destroyed houses or... Um, and that is just so insensitive, it's untrue, isn't it? I mean, I honestly can't believe people even think that's appropriate. Um, and I've heard of, you know, friends of friends doing that, knowing that their friend has lost a house in this eruption, for example. Um, and I just don't understand that mentality, do you? No, no. It kind of, I know just hearing that now just makes me so angry after everything yeah. that we've seen over the past 24 hours. And yeah. kind of going back to the story that I shared before, that we're coming up here to see if their houses have been destroyed. And, you know, I saw, I've seen a couple of people come up here to take selfies and kind of, whilst that was going on in the background, and it's just so... I don't know, it's just so difficult to comprehend why you would, you know, come up to do that. And I get, you know, everyone kind of might want to say, you know, I was here, I saw this eruption, that type of thing. But just going back to what Ben said, you know, even if you're not a researcher, when it comes to social media, you should always think before you press post. Yes. And I think it's incredibly important for you to stop and think, should I be posting this? Should I just keep it for, you know, my personal camera roll? Should I have taken it in the first place? Should I delete it? Um, and it's, you know, you should consider the context of those photos that you're taking and the context that they're taken in and just be incredibly sensitive to the situation that's going on here because, you know, you can, you can feel the emotion just sat here. You can, you know, it has an effect on you. And I think we will all have been quite affected whilst being here. Um, so please, please, please just consider what you're doing, where, when, how, and as I said, just please think before you hit post. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, I'd just like to add to that. Um, you know, obviously in this, in this age of, of media, you know, they say pictures sell stories and, and everything, but you know, at, at no point should, should anyone or, or any outlets, in, in my opinion, be, be you know, posting pictures or taking images, you know, that are, are, are amplifying the, the suffering of, of, of the people here and, you know, as we said, doing more, more harm, harm than good. Um, you know, especially, you know, if, if you're reporting on an eruption, you, you can do an excellent job of reporting it and you can report it brilliantly and factually and put it in context. You know, with, without the need to, you know, show show these, you know, graphic images and, and, and 
really that, that you know could be really traumatic for, for lots of people, especially locals. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yes, yeah, so we have somebody. We have Connor here saying hello. Looks like the uh, volcano is full on erupting again. Yeah, it certainly looks that way. Uh, if you uh, rewind the um, the live feed later, Connor, you'll be able to see all the. Uh, science update that uh, Ben and Alexis gave us in the context which is good and uh, Lobo7667 is saying thank you good night very interesting live stay safe thank you yes we will we don't take any unnecessary risks uh, I don't think there's any need for that again you know we don't want to sensationalize things we want to give you different perspectives while we're here and different stories but we certainly won't be putting ourselves in harm's way uh, in order to do that or complicating anybody's jobs um, by getting into difficulties doing that, so that's, uh, that's really important. Great. Well, if, if anybody, uh, so has it has the vent got bigger? Looks like it. Somebody's like Connor's asking. So again, that goes back to what we were saying about the shape yeah. of all the uh, the eruption. Yeah. yeah. So so what we've had sort of all well, for the, the past couple of days at least uh, is we've had sort of the main central cone um, in the center of this cone we've had sort of between two or three vents uh, at a time and then we've had a, a vent on the on the lower flank now the, the, the last few days the the central vents have been by far the most the most active the vents on the flank you know it was quite variable in size i know yesterday morning it grew um, but then sort of yesterday afternoon it was it was dying down again, uh, but it's interesting because now that the volcano, you know, had a bit of quiescence um, throughout today, now it's, it's reactivating, it's back to, you know, nearly full strength. It's actually the, the vent on the flank, um, which is by far, by far the more, more active vent. Um, and yeah, in terms of the shape of the lava fountains that we went through this with, Alexis earlier um, generally vents that are on the flank rather than sort of at the, the centre of the cone um, are more effusive which simply means you know it's less explosive um, so the material is being uh, consequently not shot as high um, you know which is why we see the lower fountains um, and also the the shape of the vents can really influence sort of what we we see so you know it's like putting your finger over the end of the end of the hose pipe in, in the way that you know it, a small event will produce sort of a thinner and higher part of the magma um, or a sort of a larger vent because there's less less pressure in it because it's larger the the fountain will be probably wider and, and shorter which is kind of what we see what we see here I have to say one of the lovely things about uh, what's been happening here the last few days as well is how many of our previous geo interns have been getting in touch and getting involved with us uh, and in fact we've just been joined uh, on our live here by Marley de Jong. Hello Marley, lovely to see you. Marley was here with us a few years ago and in fact as was Pam Rattigan, now Pam Campbell, Pamela Campbell, she was here uh, this afternoon and you did a, a, a lovely um, live transmission with her it was very nice to see her and of course she was a La Palma um, geo intern back in 2014 our very first year that we did it here uh, and of course we've been bringing students to La Palma for a number of years and they've been collaborating with local institutions on the monitoring of this island um, and keeping an eye on on the degassing and other 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 areas that they've been looking at um, and I have to say Ignacio's here with us and uh, Ignacio, we've, we've been coming every year to La Palma, but I don't think we we ever believed we'd be in this situation of coming here and, and actually seeing a, an eruption, do you? But I dreamt. I dreamt uh, of it every time I was uh, driving through all these roads and seeing the amount of uh, different type of um, lava flows. Uh, I, I, I was quite impressed. And the whole time I was imagining um, a future eruption or imagining 
the the eruption that caused uh, that uh, specific lava flow that I was visiting. Some sometimes walking on top, some some other times just taking pictures and see the con 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 const contract con construct uh, contrast contrast. <laughs> Sorry oh, yeah. about that. <laughs> yeah, uh, of the um, green part and the. Um, geological feature of the lava flow. I mean, <laughs> I'm quite interested in, in botany and, and it, that relationship between uh, geology and uh, botany is what I really like and I really enjoyed uh, that part of La Palma that uh, must be uh, partially uh, destroyed right yes. now. Uh, in one way, sad. Uh, but on the other other side, you you just are having what you were dreaming of, uh, despite all that's, this destruction. That's the dichotomy, you see? Yes, yes, that's the dichotomy, mm. isn't it? Just uh, you know, it's a, an extraordinary event uh, to witness, but at the same time, you know, it's it's sort of caught up. And I have a feeling that we're all going to go away from La Palma and just have to sort of digest what, what we've heard, what we've seen, what we've experienced. You know, we haven't had much sleep. You know, we've um, we've been full on here, so uh, yes, I think it'll take us some time to, to unwind it all. Um, we're being asked, was that um, any, have we had any more earthquakes today? I mean, have you have you had any more? Have you, can you remember feeling any more today? I haven't looked at the actual official information. No, the the I haven't felt any. The I know that um, that. Sort of earlier today, there was um, there was uh, a small seismic form. Um, this is um, yeah. There are not many details um, on this. Um, all we know is that um, it was to it was to the south um, of, of the current vent, um, and there was a few earthquakes at sort of seven to ten um, kilometers depth. Um, but yeah, they they were all earthquakes that um, you know would not be perceptible by people. You know, shouldn't cause any damage um, on, on the surface. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, we haven't had any more information on on, on those since since this afternoon. So. Okay, I know that we've had um, some reports of sort of some rocks coming loose and rock fall and that sort of thing and perhaps that's something we could address in tomorrow's uh, live feed because I know we've had a lot of questions about that. Um, but I think for tonight uh, we should thank everybody for joining us today and for all of your questions. It's always a, a real privilege to, to answer your questions and spend some time with you uh, and Ben. And Rosie, just to say, very well done indeed. Um, it's always great to hear your perspective uh, on what you're doing and all the hard work you're putting into keeping people informed sympathetically but accurately as well, because it's not easy. These two guys are, you know, they've, they've only had uh, social media training for, what, five, six weeks now. And look at them sitting here reporting from the heart, factually, correctly, um, spending time very meticulously throughout the day to make sure that they keep up to date with all the latest developments and I have to say I'm super proud of them super proud of them um, and Ryan Bailey yes we miss you you've only <laughs> been gone half a day and we miss you all right thank you very much everybody keep an eye on our social media and I'm sure we'll, we'll connect up again tomorrow but I have to say my battery pack is running low my phone is running low and I think we're probably running low on battery as well so we look forward to seeing everybody tomorrow thank you very much thank you, bye bye bye, bye. bye.